Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different aspects of the molecular biology in this particular MOOC course. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the cell biology, we have discussed about the uh, different types of biomolecules, we have discussed about the role of these biomolecules into the cellular metabolisms and uh, other kinds of important cellular functions such as cell division, uh, cellular apoptosis, cell growth and the autophagy. Uh, in previous couple of modules, we were discussing about the central dogma of molecular biology. So, we have discussed about the uh, what is the requirement of the central dogma of molecular biology, why it is so important for the uh, maintenance of the uh, life on earth and what are the different processes which are being part of the central dogma of molecular biology. So, as you, what you can see here is that the central dogma of molecular biology is consists of three important processes. One is the duplication of the genomic content that is being done by a process known as replications followed by uh, the, uh, the for synthesis of the different types of RNAs, RNA from the uh, from the DNA and that process is being known as the transcription. And then from the when the RNA is being synthesized, it is going to be utilized by the, by the uh, ribosome and the protein synthesis machinery to synthesize the protein and this process is known as translation. So, in the current module, we are discussing about the translations and so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the translation uh, different types of steps in the of translation in the prokaryotic system and as well as in the eukaryotic system and uh, we have discussed about the uh, uh, genetic codes, how the people have discovered the genetic code and what are the different types of genetic codes which are possible. And then we have discussed about the uh, initiation, uh, elongation and terminations in the case of the prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic system and what are the different significant differences between the translation in the prokaryote versus the translation in the eukaryotes. Now, with this uh, detailed discussion about the translation in the current uh, lecture, we are going to discuss about what happens once the protein is being synthesized and how the cellular system is changing this protein so that it becomes more useful for uh, regulating the different types of events or how it is participating into the uh, uh, different types of uh, processes. So, uh, what we have discussed, we have discussed about the central dogma and uh, at the end of the translations, you are going to get the synthesis of the different types of proteins. Now, once you have a protein, right, uh, it is actually going to be present as a, a nascent protein or I will say it will not be a unmature, uh, unmature proteins, right. So, this protein has to be converted into a protein which is more of uh, mature, right. So, uh, what is mean by the mature is that this protein may require the some kind of modifications uh, which is not possible by the translational machinery to do it. So, that it will be more useful and it will be more functional in terms of the doing the different types of task what is being given by the cellular system or what would be the requirement of the cellular system. So, that is why I am writing this as protein as an immature, it is not applicable to all the proteins. It is possible that some of the protein which are being produced after translation could be in the final form and could be utilized as such. So, one of the classical uh, examples what you have seen is the uh, proteins are getting truncated, right. So, one of the modification could be the truncations. Uh, classical example is uh, when you are converting a, a proenzyme into a active enzyme, right. There are many examples such as uh, pro pepsinogen, right, sorry, uh, pepsinogen. right this is a inactive form of the enzyme and when it is getting cleaved off it is forming a enzyme which is called as pepsin and that is the active enzyme 
so this is also happens after the synthesis of the pepsinogen. Now, uh, truncation is a very very important component. Then you also have the different types of the uh, covalent or the non-covalent uh, modifications, mostly the covalent modifications such as the uh, phosphorylations, such as glycosylation, such as ubiquitinylation or acetylation. So, all these are these uh, different types of changes right and all these changes are bringing a very significant difference into that particular protein. For example, the phosphorylation it is going to impart a negative charge right and that negative charge is very important right because it may actually change the different types of scenarios and different types of interactions. Similarly, the glycosylation that is actually going to impart a hydrophobic uh, patch, right. So, if you have a uh, you know glycosylation, it is actually going to reduce the solubility of that particular protein, and because it is going to be less soluble, it is actually going to increase the stability of that particular protein. And we'll discuss is that in detail how it happens actually. Uh, similarly, ubiquitinylation that is also a part of the protein degradation pathway. So, it is actually going to be a part of the uh, protein degradation pathway. So, it is actually going to uh, induce the protein degradation and acetylation is also going to induce the negative charge and uh, it is actually going to add the or it is actually going to add up the energy part right. So, it is going to add up the high energy bonds and that is how it is actually going to provide the energy into the system. Uh, same is happening with the phosphorylation also that is also actually going to add up the energy into the system and that is how it is actually going to incorporate the high energy into the system. Now, let us first talk about the phosphorylation right. So, phosphorylation is uh, one of the most important and the uh, important uh, modifications uh, after the protein is been synthesized. So, post translational phosphorylations. Phosphorylation is an important post translational modification. It is prevalent from the bacteria to higher eukaryotes sustainably as many to, uh, as mainly two types. First, it acts to functionally regulate the catalytic activity of protein by defining a rigid and permanent three dimensional structure. Secondly, Temporarily phosphorylation proteins serve as an anchor for other protein substrate in signal transduction pathways. As such, it acts as a key player in the regulation of many cellular processes such as cell cycle, cell growth, apoptosis and regulation of the cellular transactions. So, what it says is that if the protein is going to be get phosphorylated, so it is going to be get phosphorylated with the help of the ADP and the protein is going to contain the going to take up the phosphate from the ATP. Then this protein is actually going to have or it is going to incorporate two different types of uh, functionality functional uh, uh, you know functional uh, things into the protein. It is actually going to regulate its activity and you will see uh, examples right. You, you, and the second part is it is actually going to uh, add up into the interaction of the proteins during signal transactions. I am sure you might have seen the uh, cellular signaling. Okay. So, you might have seen different types of signal transduction pathways, I think we have discussed about the apoptotic pathways, uh, intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway and how the cell, cell signaling is occurring from the death receptor pathway or the mitochondrial pathway and how the proteins are involved into this. So, phosphorylation is also having the different similar kind of uh, cascades and that is being maintained by the phosphate. So, some once you have the phosphorylation, it is actually attract the other proteins and that is how you are going to have a detailed signal transductions. 
So, um, for example, the insulin signaling and uh, there are so many growth factor signaling, there are so many signaling pathways which are very well designed and very well uh, discussed. Similarly, you have the regulation of uh, enzymatic activity. So, uh, sometimes the phosphorylation actually brings the higher activity, sometimes the phosphorylation brings the lower activity. And you might have seen many of these examples when we were discussing about the uh, glycolysis and Krebs cycle because you might have seen the many of the enzymes present in the glycolysis and Krebs cycle whose activities are being regulated similarly by the phosphorylations. Now, let us see what is the mechanism of phosphorylations. So, in a eukaryotic cell the phosphorylation is known to occur only at the side chain of the 3 amino acids serine, threonine and tyrosine. Okay. And what you see here is that there is a significant similarity between the 3 amino acids and what is the similarity? Similarity is that they are all containing a hydroxyl group and which contains a lone pair of electrons. So, this is very, very important um, uh, feature of an of a amino acid because the amino acid should have a lone pair of electrons so that it actually can participate into the uh, phosphorylation reactions. And that is why you will see that in the eukaryotic system you have the serine, threonine and tyrosine, but in the other system like for example, in the bacterial system you also have the aspartate which is getting phosphorylated, you also have the uh, histidine which is getting phosphorylated and so on. So, because the histidine is also having the nitrogen which is having the lone pair and the aspartate is having the this right aspartate is having this as a lone pair right this is the terminal hydroxyl uh, terminal carboxylate group and you are actually going to have the lone pair on this so that is what it is actually going to do so in, in the histidine you are actually going to have the nitrogen in the aspartate you are actually going to have the COH uh, group and this is actually going to participate into the phosphorylation reaction. So, as I said the lone pair of electron is going to be uh, you know requisition or going to be important for these kind of modifications. This is because these amino acids harbor a nucleophilic hydroxyl group. The terminal phosphate group on the universal phosphate donor adenosine ATP serves as the point of nucleophilic attack from the OH group which results in the transfer of phosphate group to the amino acid side chain. Magnesium ion act as a catalyst by chelating the gamma and beta phosphate group resulting into the lowering of the threshold for the phosphoryl transfer of the nucleophilic groups. So, that is what you are going to see right. Uh, so, this is the example of the serine uh, kinase you can expect the similar kind of mechanisms even for the other modifications. So, what you see here is that this is the actually the protein where you have the serine and then serine has actually this lone pair of electrons. So, these lone pairs of electrons are actually going to act onto the onto this particular phosphate. So, what you see here is this is the ATP and in the ATP you have the three different types of phosphate. You have the alpha phosphate, you have beta phosphate and you have gamma phosphate. So, it all the phosphorylation reactions actually works with the help of the gamma phosphate. So, in the gamma phosphate there will be a nucleophilic attack from the lone pair of electron what is present and as a result this particular group is actually going to get broken down from here and then this will go like this. So, it is actually going to get converted into ADP and this portion will actually go and attach here and that is how you are going to have this the phosphoserine okay, and that phosphoserine is actually going to be formed. Now, the similar kind of thing can happen even with the threonine or histidine and aspartate. So, the enzymes name would be different uh, in this case it is going to be called as uh, serine kinase. Uh, if it is a aspartate then it is going to be called as aspartate kinase, if it is a histidine then it is going to be called as histidine kinase and so on. And uh, majority, as I said, you know, histidine kinase and aspartate kinase are more prevalent in the case of the uh, prokaryotic system. But uh, in the eukaryotic system, you only have the serine, threonine, and tyrosine. Now, 
these conformational uh, changes can affect the protein in two different ways. So, the phosphorylation once you have a phosphorylation it is actually going to neutralize the or it is actually going to bring the additional negative charge right. What you see here is that I, I right now it is actually uncharged right it does not have any uh, any charge right this is the uncharged amino acid, but this one is negatively charged right. So, it is actually bringing additional charge and because of this additional charge wherever the serine is present uh, it either will uh, make up the new uh, interactions. So, it is actually going to contribute into the new interactions because uh, negative is going to attract by the positive right. So, it is going to have the uh, some kind of solvage interactions or hydrogen bonding interactions or van der Waals interactions with the neighboring residues or it may actually break the interactions. Both uh, there are both possibilities right it either can form the new interactions or it actually can break the uh, pre existing interactions. So, if it is going to bring the new interaction it is actually going to make the structure more compact and that is how uh, or it may actually bring the conformational changes. But if it is breaking the interaction pre existing interactions then it is actually going to make the interaction make the structure more loose and majority of these interaction majority of these modifications always occurs in uh, active site right. So, active side of an enzyme or sometime into the regulatory side also, but uh, mostly if it is happen in the active side the active side could be more compact or active side could be more relaxed. And both of these events are actually going to participate or going to modulate the catalytic activity of the enzyme. Sometime they may not doing anything with the catalytic activity uh, they may be actually bringing the additional uh, you know surface right. So, the negative charge is there and it is actually going to bring the additional charge uh, additional charge and that additional charge could be a uh, uh, could serve as a uh, interaction site or docking site for new proteins right. This is what we said in the previous slide right that sometime it actually provides the docking site for the new interaction and that is how it is actually going to participate into the signal transactions because until this phosphorylation does not occur this is not going to be recognized by the next uh, proteins and once the next protein will go and bind this it is actually going to be get phosphorylated and so on and that is why there will be a cascade of the uh, phosphorylation reactions from one enzyme to another enzyme and the third enzyme and so on and that is why it is actually going to make a uh, signal reductions. So, once this happens it is actually going to bring the for conformational changes and that may affect the protein in two different ways. Phosphorylation causing the conformational changes in the phosphorylated protein these conformational changes stimulate the catalytic activity of proteins. So, any protein can be activated or inactivated by the phosphorylations. So, this is what exactly happens when you have an in inactive enzyme and if it is getting phosphorylated with the help of a kinase uh, and that utilizes the uh, ATP then it is actually going to be phosphorylated and that phosphorylated enzyme could be more active. Sometime it happens that uh, and uh, it it may, it may be other way around that you have active enzyme and then it becomes inactive enzyme, but that depends on the type of conformational changes it is bringing into the system and what could be how it is going to impact the structure of that enzyme. Once you have the phosphorylated enzyme then there will be another set of enzyme which is called as the phosphatase enzyme and that phosphatase enzyme is going to bring the enzyme back into the unphosphorylated form and that is how it is actually going to shuttle uh, between the two state one is active enzyme the another one is the inactive enzyme and so on. So, phosphorylated proteins employ the neighboring proteins which have structurally conserved domain that distinguish and bind to the phosphomotis. These domains are specific for the diverse amino acids. Protein phosphorylation is a reversible post translational modification which is carried out by the kinases which phosphorylate and phosphatases which dephosphorylate to the substrate. These two type of enzyme make possible the dynamic nature of the phosphorylated protein. So, that 
the balance concentration of the kinase and phosphatase is very important for the cell and it is also important for the catalytic efficiency of a particular phosphorylation site. So, these two enzymes the kinase and the phosphatase are actually going to be always be present in a pair. So, you are going to have a tyrosine kinase, you are also going to have a tyrosine phosphatase. So, that when the tyrosine kinase is going to make the changes into any protein, there will be a tyrosine phosphoryl, uh, phosphatase that is actually going to reverse these changes. So, that you are not going to have the only uh, you know downstream signaling, you are also going to have the upstream signaling. So, that you are also going to nullify the effects otherwise you can imagine that if you have started a process it has to be shut down right and that shutting down is only by the these kind of pair of these enzymes. For example, if the kinase is making the system on then the phosphatase is actually making a system off and that is what it is actually going to work in pairs. Now, the question comes what could be the um, ways in which you can be able to detect the phosphorylations. So, uh, you can actually be able to use the uh, activity which, uh, which is called as uh, western blotting. So, you can actually be able to use the western blotting and you can use the uh, these modification specific antibodies like for example, you can use the anti uh, phosphoserine antibody. Okay. Although uh, we have not discussed uh, western blotting so far, but I think we are going to discuss. Uh, so, that time you will be able to understand full detail about how the people are doing the western blotting and how the people are using these antibodies. And uh, that anyway we are going to take up when we are going to talk about the molecular techniques in the subsequent uh, modules. So, you are going to use the antiphosphoserine as the primary antibody right. So, many of these uh, terms many of these uh, things you will understand once uh, we are going to discuss about this. So, the first is you are actually going to do it with the western blotting and you are going to use the uh, specific primary antibodies such as antiphosphoserine antibodies, anti threonine, phosphothionine uh, antibodies or uh, anti phosphotyrosine. So, these antibodies are being directed against the phosphorylated tyrosine. So, it is going to recognize only the phosphorylated tyrosine, it is not going to recognize the unmodified tyrosine present in the proteins and that is how it is actually going to give you the signal. Apart from that uh, you can also use the specific proteins like uh, anti phospho P38 or those kind of proteins also those kind of antibodies also. Then the second is uh, you can be able to uh, change you can be able to uh, use the uh, spectroscopic method right. So, you can use you can be able to determine whether there is a modification of will and you can actually be able to use the many type of dyes which are specific for the phosphorylations. So, uh, you can use like uh, uh, you can use the uh, malachite green So, malachite green is specific for the phospho uh, proteins it does not react with the normal protein and that is how you can actually be able to use uh, malachite green. Number 3 uh, you can also use the fluoromid uh, fluorescence or fluorescence spectroscopy. So, or you can use the uh, so the here you can use the uh, a, a probe which is been called as pro q. Okay. So, you can use a probe which is called as pro q. Pro q is a proprietary um, probe which is available from the molecular probes and uh, and when it reacts with the uh, phosphoproteins uh, it when it reacts with the phosphoprotein not the normal protein it actually going to give you the orange fluorescence. So, what you can do is you can just resolve the proteins onto a SDS page. So, it is actually going to give you the bands right and these bands you can actually be able to stain with pro q 
and when you do that it is actually going to give you the pattern right it is going to give you the pattern wherever you have the phosphorylations ok. So, whichever band is phosphorylated it is actually going to give you the signal into the orange flu uh, fluorescence and that can be captured with the help of the uh, scanners. So, you are actually going to have uh, specific scanners which can actually be able to capture the fluorescence at the particular wavelength. So, it is going to give you the image right and that can be used very easily and very uh, uh, with a with, with lot of you know there is no it is a user friendly techniques of doing that. Then the fourth is uh, you can also use the NMR, you can use the other kinds of uh, analytical techniques. So, that I am not going to discuss in detail because we have discussed that in a, one of our MOOCs course which is called as experimental biotechnology. So, we have discussed in detail about how the phosphorylation of the protein can be detected and so on. Now, uh, phosphorylation is playing a very crucial role in many of the events. And as I said you know when you have a protein which is getting phosphorylated and you are actually generating a phosphoprotein uh, you are actually changing many things right. You are changing the charge right. So, you are actually adding up the charge then you are also changing the energy level right or you are actually adding the high energy bonds into the system you are actually changing the size of the protein you are also changing the uh, molecular weight because it could be an attachment point for the other protein and that is how they may actually come and attach. Size means it is going to change the hydrodynamic surface area of the protein because the protein could be uh, more uh, impact, uh, compact or less uh, you know it is going to be loose and depending upon that it is going to change the size right. And it is also going to change the activity of the enzyme. So, it is going to change the many things. Uh, and the phosphorylation is a very, very, very important um, post translational modifications. Now, let us move on to the next phosphorylation modification and the next modification is called as the glycosylations. So, glycosylation is the dire function of the biosynthetic secretory pathway in the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. Approximately 50 percent protein characteristically expressed in a cell go through this alteration which involves the covalent addition of the sugar moieties to the specific amino acid. Mostly soluble and membrane bound protein expressed in the endoplasmic reticulum undergoes glycosylation including all secretory protein, surface receptors and ligand. Moreover, some proteins are being transferred from the Golgi to the ecosystem for their glycosylations. So, glycosylation is a very, very important um, post translational modification because it actually been uh, used as a system to uh, for the for the vesicular trafficking. So, it is actually going to be used as a system to deliver a protein from the one compartment of the cell to the another compartment of the cell. So, you know that the protein are actually going to be synthesized onto the ribosome. And these ribosomes are actually going to be attached onto the endoplasmic reticulum and that is why you are going to have two different types of endoplasmic reticulum. You are going to have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and you are going to have the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum the ribosomes are attached onto the ribosome and attached onto the endoplasmic reticulum and when they synthesize the protein the protein goes inside the endoplasmic reticulum and get folded. And once it get folded it is going to be packed into the vesicle and then it is actually going to be transported to the Golgi bodies. When it goes into the Golgi bodies, the Golgi bodies are adding the specific glycosylation patterns which involves the glucose, fructose, mannose, uh, aerobinose and all other kinds of drug uh, all other kinds of glucose and a combination of glucose and that is how it is actually going to make the specific signal. It is going to make the specific tag and that specific tag is actually going to be recognized only by the specific uh, receptors what are pre present on to a particular organelle. For example, if the Golgi bodies has put the uh, tag for the mitochondria right, then that tag is and then it is actually going to be packed into a vesicle and then vesicle will go and interact with the endo mitochondria 
and that vesicle is actually going to be taken up by the mitochondria by the interaction of a tag and the receptor what is present onto the uh, mitochondria. And then at the end uh, this protein is going to be delivered specifically to the mitochondria not to the any other compartment not to like lysozymes or not to the uh, plasma membrane or not to like nucleus or any other thing. So, this is a very very important glycosylation. So, glycosylation is actually a very very important uh, modifications. Now, the glycosylation uh, is uh, being done by the different types of sugar. So, it actually can be glucose, it can be fructose, it can be fucose, it could be uh, mannose, galactose, arabinose and so on. Now, once you add a sugar, you are actually going to add the hydrophobic groups. Okay? Remember that uh, the sugar is polar, but the sugar moieties are when they coming together, they are not very polar. right? So, they are actually going to bring the dual characters, they are actually going to bring the hydrophobic charges also and they are also going to bring the polar charges also. Because you, if you see a size structure of the sugar, right? this is the sugar. And uh, what you see here is that it is going to have the OH going to have H, but it is also going to have this ring. right? So, this ring is actually hydrophobic right? and these are actually the polar groups. Okay? So, it is actually going to bring the mixed environment into the interaction and that is how it is actually going to make the proteins there are you know, it is going to make the modifications. Then the second is it is actually going to change the size. Okay? because these are actually not going to get compact. They, when they are being present inside the protein structure, they are actually going to make the protein structure more loose and because of that it is actually going to impact the size of the protein. Then it also going to change the interaction of the protein with other proteins, with proteins or with substrate. Okay, because you know if there is this glucose molecule which is going to be attached, it is actually going to occupy that space and it is not may not provide this the space for the substrate to interact. Similarly, it may actually in allow the interaction of the some of the proteins. And uh, glycosylation is also going to change as I said you know the surface chemistry or the charges uh, of whatever present right. So, that is what now, the question comes uh, how you can be able to study the glycosylation if the protein is getting glycosylated. Number one, you can actually be able to use the western blotting with the help of the anti glycosylated uh, antibodies and that anyway we are not going to discuss. Number two, you can actually be able to use the SDS page. Uh, remember that this, this method what we are discussing is uh, more about the uh, if you have the pure proteins. So, suppose you want to know whether the protein is getting glycosylated or not. So, when you what you can do is you can add the protein, you can add the glucose. So, what will happen is it is actually going to make the glycosylated protein. right? Now, whether this is forming or not that you can actually be able to know because it's, it could be one single glucose or it could be a multiple glucose. So, when the glucose is going to bind it is actually going to change the size of the protein. It is not going to change the molecular weight to that extent. So, it is not going to change the molecular weight, it is actually going to change the size. So, if, which the, if the protein is very compact, it may actually make the bigger balls. So, when you run it on the SDS page for example, so this is the protein and this is going to be the protein which is glycosylated or you have run the reaction for glycosylation. So, imagine that if you have a protein band here, right? then because the size is gone up, right? so it will behave like as a high molecular weight protein and that is how it is actually going to run like here. 
Now how you know that this is actually glycosylated, so what you can do is you can actually be able to treat this with uh, acid or you can treat it with the enzyme. You, there are specific enzymes like the uh, glycosidases. So, if you treat it with the glycosidases, right, then what will happen is this is actually going to be get converted into proteins. So, if I have another lane, right, if I have another lane of saying that protein glycosylated minus plus enzyme, okay, or acid, then what will happen is this band is again going to return back to the normal band. So, this is actually the protein band. This is the glycosylated band and this is the uh, unglycosylated band. So, it, this will prove that the protein is glycosylated. If it is does not move, if it is remain here, then it is actually been uh, some kind of artifacts or it is not getting specifically being glycosylated. There are something happened funny and it cannot be explained by this. So, there are many other method you can actually have the some of the dyes, uh, periodic acid and all the so that anyway we are not going to discuss in detail about this. Now the second uh, another, another uh, post translational modification is the ubiquitinylation. So, this is another post translational modification where ubiquitin which is a protein actually is added to the protein. Ubiquitin is the eukaryotic protein coded by the four different genes in the mammalian cells such as UBA52, RPS27A and UBB and the UBC. Protein is made up of, of 76 amino acid and has a molecular weight of 8.5 kDa. It is characterized by the specific presence of C terminal tail and the 7 uh, lysine residues. In ubiquitinization, basically the carboxylic acid side of the terminal glycine from the diglycine notifin the active activated ubiquitin forms an amide bond to the epsilon amino of the lysine in the modified protein. It marks the cellular protein for the process of degradation via the proteasome, changes the protein localization, prevent or promote the protein protein interactions. So, what happen is that in the protein you have the different types of lysines. So, when you are adding the ubiquitin and ubiquitin has a glycine, so glycine on the C terminal right and uh, when you are going to do the ubiquitinylation reactions, what will happen is that the protein is having a lysine and it is going to attach by a glycine and the ubiquitin is going to be attached. So, this ubiquitin is going to be attached with the help of the terminal lysine what is present on the ubiquitin by binding to the lysine and that is how it, this protein is actually going to be tagged for the cellular degradations. Now, how it happens that you are going to you know uh, ubiquitinylate this protein not any other proteins. So, there is a complete set of reactions what are going to happen when you are going to do ubiquitinylation of a particular protein and there is a balance and checks which actually allows and to the identifier that particular protein and then only it is actually going to be get ubiquitinylate. So, it actually happens in the multiple steps. So, in the step 1 you are going to do the activation of ubiquitin. So, this is going to happen here. So, it occurs in a two step reaction process. At first, the ubiquitin interact with the ATP and forms the ubiquitinate adnylate intermediate. In the next step, the ubiquitin is transferred to E1 active site enzyme containing the cysteine residue. This causes the formation of thioester linkage between the C terminal carboxyl group of the ubiquitin and the E1 cysteine uh, surfilter groups. So, this is what exactly happens. So, this is the step 1 where the, the this is the ubiquitin and it is actually going to be attached with ATP and that is how it is actually going to form the activated ubiquitin and that activated ubiquitin is going to bind the even uh, ubiquitin and it is actually going to uh, you know form the thioester linkage. Then in the step, step 2, the step 2 there will be a transfer of ubiquitin E1 active site to the E2 active site via the trans esterification reaction. So, that is what exactly happens. Then you are going to have the entry of the E2 um, ubiquitin 
and it is E 2 enzyme and it is actually going to replace the E 1 enzyme and it is going to form the E 2 uh, with the thioester linkage the ubiquitin is present. In the last step of the ubiquitin lylation cascade, there is a formation of the isopeptide bond between the lysine of the target protein and the C terminal glycine of the ubiquitin via the activity of the 1 of the 100 of the E 3 ubiquitin ligase. So, then you are going to have the E 3 ubiquitin lysase and it is actually going to bind on one side E 2 which actually has the ubiquitin and the target protein uh, and the other side you are going to have the proteins which actually has the I mean uh, lysine groups. And then th this is going to be transferred onto the amino group right of the lysine and that is why you are going to have the ubiquitin which is attached onto the target protein by the isopeptide bond. So, this is actually a peptide bond, but because you have a main chain peptide bond this will be called as the isopeptide bond. Okay. And uh, you can have this cycle continue. So, from here it goes again here and then this cycle continues and then you are going to have the addition of multiple uh, ubiquitin molecules. So, you can imagine that if you have a protein, uh, protein may have the lysine and to this lysine the ubiquitin is going to be attached in the uh, first cycle. In the second cycle another ubiquitin is attached, in the third cycle another ubiquitin is attached and so on. And remember that I told you right the ubiquitin is also having the lysine. So, it is actually possible that sometime you may it may have the ubiquitin like this. So, in some cases it happens that uh, instead of adding the ubiquitin to the target protein it may actually add the ubiquitin to the uh, existing ubiquitin because the ubiquitin has a 7 uh, uh, lysine residues the terminal C terminal amino acids. So, it actually can attach 7 uh, ubiquitin at once right and that is why the ubiquitinylation could be mono ubiquitinylations or it could be poly ubiquitinylations ok. And you can see that how it is actually going to change. So, you, you can have a mono ubiquitinylation so that only the one ubiquitin is going to attach onto the subset protein or it could be a poly ubiquitinylation. So, poly ubiquitinylation could be linear chain or it could be uh, branch chains right. So, it could be branch chains and uh, the purpose of the ubiquitinylation is that it is actually going to mark the protein for the cellular degradations. So, it is going to deliver that protein into the proteasome systems. So, what happen is that when you are going to have a protein and when you are going to uh, do the ubiquitinylation. So, if we say getting the ubiquitinylations it is going to be get converted into the protein ubiquitin ok. So, I am just making uh, taking a simple example of the mono ubiquitinylations ok. Now, ubiquitin is a 8.3 KDA protein ok. So, if the one protein is been attached it is actually going to change the molecular weight of the protein by uh, uh, by uh, 8.3 KDA ok. So, if it is immune ubiquitinylation, if it is a poly ubiquitinylation you can actually be able to you know multiply the same number and so when the, there will be a ubiquitinylation it is actually going to change the molecular weight of the target protein. Number 2 it is actually going to change the size of the protein then number 3 it is actually going to change the surface surface interactions right. So, it is actually going to allow this protein to interact and because it is changing the molecular weight it is also going to impact the solubility of this particular protein because more and more protein you are adding it is becoming more and more heavy and if you know that the heavy molecules are going to be less soluble compared to the light molecules right it's because the protein itself is soluble, but when you are adding all these kind of thing it is going to be more soluble it is going to be less soluble. So, it is going to impact the solubility this means once it get impact to the solubility it is actually going to make the particulate matter is going to be form the particulate matter and these particulate matters are actually going to be a part of the proteasome degradation pathway. So, it is going to be attracted by the proteasome system 
and that's how they will be delivered to the proteasome and they will be get degraded by the system. So, it's going to be degraded. Uh, in some cases, the monoubiquitinylation or polyubiquitinylation, because it changes the size and the surface interactions, it also brings the additional functionality into the system. Now, how you can be able to study the ubiquitinylation? So, you can actually be able to have the, as I said, you know, you are actually going to have the change in the molecular weight, you are going to have the change in the uh, hydrodynamic surface area, which means the, uh, uh, the size and it is also going to change the surface chemistry. So, first thing is you can actually be able to do the western blotting with the help of the specific antibody that we are not going to discuss. Number 2, you can also be able to change check the molecular weight. Okay? So, you can actually be able to run the SDS page and SDS page is going to tell you because in the each uh, ubiquitinylation round, it is actually going to increase the size by 8.3 kT. Right? So, you can imagine if you are going to have the addition of 5 ubiquitin, then it is actually going to be approximately 40 kDa. There will be a change in the 40 kDa and so on. So, if you run the system on the SDS page and suppose this is a protein and this is a protein uh, ubiquitin, then it is actually going to change the pattern, right. So, it is going to change the pattern and remember that with the ubiquitinylation, because you are going to get the multiple species you are going to have suppose this is a protein right. So, you are going to have a ubiquitin then you are going to have the so this is in the cycle 1 okay? and uh, again the same protein uh, you are going to have ubiquitin then it is going to attach with another ubiquitin right you are going to be another ubiquitin this is in the cycle 2. Okay? So, in the cycle 2 you are going to have 2 ubiquitin then cycle 3 you are going to have 3, 4, 5, 6 like that. So, that is why you are not going to get single band, you are going to get a band here, then band here, band here, band here, band here. So, it is actually going to show you a ladder kind of pattern or I will say it is actually going to show you the smear. So, if you are getting a smear, then that means that it is actually going to be uh, ubiquitin Now, how you are going to do the conformation experiment? So, what you can do is uh, remember that the addition of the ubiquitin to the protein is being done by a bond which is called as the isopeptide bond. Right? So, this isopeptide bond cannot be cleaved by the normal proteases. Okay? It is actually going to be cleaved by the cysteine proteases. So, it is very sensitive for the cysteine proteases. So, what I can do is I can just take the PU and I will add the cysteine protease. Okay? So, if I add the cysteine protease, this all ubiquitin is going to be removed and ultimately I am going to see uh, electrophoretic mobility of this protein to its original level. So, this is the protein, this is the protein plus uh, ubiquitin and this is the uh, ubiquitin, we have lost the ubiquitin. So, all the ubiquitin you will see here actually, so you are going to see some of the ubiquitin smear on the bottom of the particular gel. So, this is uh, one of the uh, method through which you can be able to detect the ubiquitin. Number 3, you can actually be able to do the gel filtration and uh, as I said, you know, it is going to change the size of the protein. So, you can actually be able to use the gel filtration chromatography to know the size of the protein. We are not going to get into the detail of these because all these we have discussed in detail in my another MOOCs course which is called as the experimental biotechnology. So, if you are interested to know more about this, you can be able to go through with this particular MOOCs course uh, and it is actually going to tell you the complete detail about how the chromatography technique can be used for studying the uh, ubiquitinylations. Now, let us move on to the next uh, uh, modification and the next modification is the methylation. This process refers to the addition of methyl group to the nitrogen or the oxygen to the amino acid side chain. N methylation is irre irreversible, whereas O methylation is potentially reversible. Methylation changes uh, hydrophobicity of the amino acid and neutralizes the negative charge when attached to the carboxylic acid. Many methyl main methyl group contribution for the, such reaction is SAM or S adenosyl methionine. This reaction is mediated by the enzyme which is called as methyl transferases and methylation process is involved in a epigenetic regulation as the histine methylation and demethylation. So, this is methylation we have discussed in detail when we were talking about the chromatin romadling and uh, 
genomic DNA and how the packaging of the genomic DNA occurs into the eukaryotic cell. So, uh, this is all about the uh, post translational modifications and what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the central dogma of molecular biology where we have discussed about uh, replications, transcription and translations. And uh, we have discussed, we have tried to discuss in detail of these different processes into the uh, prokaryotic as well as the eukaryotic system. So, 